Amen. Praise God. I can um, see that that song affected <laughs> Chris about the same way it affected me. <laughs> the only difference was I have a little bit of opportunity to get myself together <laughs> before I get up here. And Chris, you're right there singing. So uh, thank God that we understand his love. Uh, this is Valentine's Day. <clears throat> and from a spiritual standpoint, I cannot help but think about the fact that we are the bride of Christ. The word of God says that he came and he shed his blood to redeem the bride. And so what better time, what better day for us to be here in church with the Savior, for us to actually be able to meet him here just to say thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for redeeming us. We were lost and he came and he died for us. Amen. Today, <clears throat> excuse me. Today, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Joshua six. We'll be in verse one through five. Joshua six. One through five. And it says, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a loud blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people <clears throat> shall ascend up, every man straight before him. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for blessing us today, giving us life. Thank you, Father God, for the hope that we have that every day that you wake us up, you will give us another opportunity just to see your glory. And Lord, today, even as we as a church body assemble in this place, Lord, we are just wanting to hear your voice, to hear your message, to get an understanding of what you would have us to do with the word that you're giving us today. Father, I pray that your blessings and understanding be with your people. I pray, Father God, that I decrease and that you increase in me in your spirit and make the word plain to understand. We thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'd like to preach today from the sermon topic, Stick to the Plan. Stick to the Plan. You know, as we look at this chapter in Joshua, we're seeing a, uh, a part of scripture that gives us an impossible situation. It's giving us an impossible scenario. The scenario is that this city of Jericho could not be breached. It was impossible to be breached. Surrounded completely around the city with a wall. And the scripture says that not only was it surrounded by wall, they had mighty men of valor. So I don't want you to think that this was a city where the people and the army were behind the walls and the army never came out to fight or to defend. This was a city that was surrounded by a wall and also had mighty men of valor so that when they were attacked, the men of valor, the army would rush out of the city and defeat the foes that they faced and then go back into the safety of the city. So this is an impossible scenario. And yet the scripture says 
that God spoke to Joshua and told Joshua and when Moses died that he was going to conquer, that he was going to take all the land of Canaan. So can you imagine if you are a leader and one of the first battles that you have to face is Jericho? <laughs> In those days, armies and the things that armies did and the cities and the way the cities were built, it was, it was information that was spread abroad. It's kind of like our social media. You know about the situation, you know about the person, you know about what's going on before you actually see it. This is what was happening with Jericho. And so here Joshua is, a new captain of Israel's army, a new leader for the people of Israel. And one of the first challenges that he has is how am I gonna face Jericho? How am I gonna live up to what God has said that I am supposed to do as a leader? when I have an impossible situation, when I have an impossible foe, and God heard his heart. The scripture says that the Lord appeared to him, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and gave him instructions, saying, I know that you have this city before you. I know that it seems like that this is an impossible situation, but I'm gonna give you a strategy, I'm gonna give you a plan, and I want you to just simply stick to the plan. You're gonna go around the city and you're gonna go around one time for six days. And as you go around, I want to hear the ram's horn blasting. No doubt as we think about this story, we know that when you are in a secure place, it's very easy for you from that place to shout and to talk about how great things are in there and how you're not going to be defeated and how other people have come and they were not able to defeat us. That's what the people of Jericho, no doubt, were saying. <clears throat> All six times as Israel walked around this city, this impossible situation. And yet God told Joshua to tell Israel be quiet and just walk around, just walk around. And so now we are seeing that God in our day to day is giving us similar instructions. He says the battle is mine. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter how difficult what you're experiencing seems to be. It doesn't matter if this is the first time that you've experienced it. It doesn't matter if it is your health. It doesn't matter if it's your family. It doesn't matter about anything that you're going through right now because he is the God that deals with the situations that are impossible. And the things that you experience that seem so bad to him are nothing more than another opportunity for him to get glory and our testimony. He said, stick to the plan. I want you to look in the story with me and I want you to understand that it was not the ram's horn <clears throat> that caused the city to come down, the walls of the city to come down. It wasn't the ram's horn. It wasn't the fact that they were just walking around the city that caused those walls to come down. But I want you to focus with me on verse five. And it says, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. It's the shout at the key time that causes our issues and our problems to fall. Today, this sermon is given to us to tell us to stick to the plan. The plan is for us to hold our peace and let God fight the battle but when he says to give him praise and to give him worship and to say hallelujah, that's the time that we have to have a voice for our faith. We have to have a voice for what we trust in, who we're trusting in. It's the shout that the church says at that time that brings down the walls that we face. 
Psalms 20 and 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. While others are looking for alternatives and others are looking for answers, the church only has to look to God. We only have to look to the Savior who died for us, who shed his blood and gave us freedom, not just freedom of choice, but freedom to come home to him. Freedom to come home to a place where we belonged all along and how he redeemed us and he gave us back what we gave away in foolishness. He says, stick to the plan. And in Jeremiah 29 and 11, we encourage because he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So God has already set this thing in motion. He has already revealed to us that he has a plan for us. And so why should we try to figure this thing out? Anything that we deal with, any challenge that we face, why should we spend time trying to work on the plan when he's already got the plan worked out for us? I think that I'll say that again. Why should we spend time working on the plan when God already has the plan worked out for us? Our plan that we have to stick to is to hold our peace and let him fight the battle. And when he says shout, glory to God, hallelujah, I have victory, we shout because we know that it is the sound of our praise that brings the walls down. In Exodus 14 and 14, it says, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Ye shall hold your peace. And I wanted to point out something that sometimes is a misunderstanding in scripture. It says that ye shall hold your peace. But I want you to understand that there is a difference between holding your peace and holding your praise. Because we often hear, well, I'm going to hold my peace. But what we what God doesn't want us to do is to hold our praise. Holding your peace means to maintain that place of confidence in God, that place of knowing who is our, our salvation, that place of knowing who is our security and our protection and our health. I stand in this place where I'm confident and I'm persuaded who I believe in and I will hold my peace, meaning I will hold the state of being blessed assurance Jesus is mine. I'm going to hold that place that says that God is my all in all. In doing that, I will not be afraid. I will not fear. I will not dread what tomorrow may bring because I'm holding my peace. And I'll let God fight my battle. So holding our peace does not equate to holding our praise. Often we're confused because we're we're believing that we're to be quiet. We're believing that I'm, well, you know, I'm just God's going to work it out. But where is our praise? <laughs> where is the praise in God and I will rejoice in all things? Where is that at in those times? That's what God is looking for, because the praise and the worship that we have is the thing that he uses to construct an atmosphere of change. It is the change agent that is introduced into our situation. So while we are holding our peace, letting the Lord fight our battles, we continue to praise him, amen? Isaiah 26 and three says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So it's the trusting in him that what keeps us in perfect peace. 
So when I deal with the problems and the issues and the challenges that I face, when I see those who I love dealing with problems and challenges and issues, what I am doing is I am kept in perfect peace and I am sharing this ability to be kept in perfect peace with those who are also dealing with challenges because I'm reminding myself and I'm reminding those who I love that if we keep our mind stayed on Jesus, the source, that we will have perfect peace. So then I'm being obedient. I am I am holding my peace and I'm letting the Lord fight my battle. But it does not stop my praise. I don't in that moment put down the garment that he has placed on me by his spirit, that garment of praise that is able to carry me through the times when I feel most afraid. The garment of praise should cause us and invoke in us a spirit of gratitude. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that I'm not alone. I thank you that even though it looks like the valley of the shadow of death is upon me, but I cannot fear evil because I know who is with me. Your rod, your staff comforting me, guiding me through this thing. I'm going to hold my peace. And as I hold my peace, he continues to remind me and he, he continues to as a as a film, as a video in my spiritual memory, reminding me of what he's done for me in the past, of every time that he healed me in the past, of every time that he rescued me in the past, of every time that he protected me in the past, of every time that I cried upon him and, and, and I fasted and, and nobody saw the tears that I shed, but God saw it. And as he begins to roll this thing, this spiritual movie in my mind where I can literally look at the grace of God, the protection of God, the provision of God, how he brought things together that were torn apart, how he continued to bring my heart and my mind in line with him and my peace I hold on to. Knowing that this thing, whatever it is, whatever it is, is just another opportunity for God to fight for me. So I'm going to hold my peace and I'll let the Lord fight my battles. In, I, in Psalms 34 and 1, it says, I will bless the Lord when? At all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So now God is telling us, not only how to hold our peace so that he can fight for us, but he's also saying that praise should be in our mouths at all times. Can you imagine how he feels when he looks at the bride and then we just continue to tell him how great he is, how wonderful he is? Let's just make this just real personal for a second. When my, my wife tells me how wonderful I am and, and, and how I'm a good provider and, and how patient I am, and I don't know how you can hear that, and it doesn't seem to bother you, you get over things, I, 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 I say, you know, what, what can I do for that woman? You know, what can I do for this girl? She loves me. She, she, she just she appreciates me. God says that he makes us in his image and in his likeness. So the thing that we need to do to move God on his throne on our behalf is just to begin to praise him. We're the bride. Scripture says that heaven is actually holding Jesus back. Jesus is wanting to come and to redeem us so bad that the that the word of God says he is being held back. That's how much he loves us. If the father said, go, Jesus would come and redeem us today. The rapture would happen today, but it is the father who knows the time that, that he can release the son to come and to get the bride. So what do we do? We give him we give him praise. We recall the things that he has done for us. We say what is good and what is lovely about what he's done for us. When Satan comes in and he tries to tempt us or he tries to, to discourage us, we remind him that we serve a true and a living God. 
We remind him that we are the bride. We remind him that that we are the apple of God's eye. It's nothing worse than when an enemy hears you tell him how much stronger you are. I, I, I happen to love all the the fights of Muhammad Ali. <clears throat> love them. I could watch them over and over again. And it tickles me how Muhammad Ali would announce what he was going to do to the opponent. He would tell you what round he was going to beat you up in. He would tell you the round that you were going to hit the canvas in. And guess what? It happened. <laughs> Why? Because he knew his ability. He knew his talent. And not only did he know his talent, he knew his opponent so well that he knew when you were going to get tired and when you were going to give up. And he knew if he kept jabbing you with that left, when it was going to take effect and when you couldn't take it anymore. Why are we not like that? Why are we not confident like that? When we serve the God that is above all gods, what would happen if the church began to tell Satan what God was about to do to him? We serve a true and a living God who has every time that we as a church body have come together in prayer has moved on our behalf. He has delivered us on every side. If we as a church body begin to declare what God is going to do, not just to pray for it, but to open our mouths and to declare it, then what would God do? I think he would be moved on his throne. I think that he would come in and he would change things. I think that if they shook up the, the, the acts, the, the church in Acts shook up the, the city that they were in and the surrounding territories that they, that they were in, so much so that it was as if fire was going from one city to the next, one town to the next, I think that the same would happen for us. I think that revival lies in the ability of the church to not just pray, but to declare, to declare the power of God, to unction in the power of God through our confessions of faith. In this day and time, the enemy so often tries to silence the church, tries to silence our voice. But it is through our declaration, it is through our testimony that we overcome. Amen. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And this word to rejoice is the Greek word Cairo. And it means to be cheerful and it means to have a salutation of joy. In other words, in the Bible, the, the, uh, the disciples, the apostles would say grace and peace. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. In other words, when they greeted one another, they were saying, I have the ability to pronounce a blessing on you. I pronounce the grace of God be upon you. And so now we're seeing that that our ability to to speak those things that God is going to do are a powerful offensive weapon in the kingdom. <clears throat> in Luke 19, 37 through 40, he says, and when he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And I'll go further. But what this is, is this is the account where Jesus came in through the Eastern gate. And as he is coming in, the glory and the, and, and the anointing of God was upon Christ Jesus. And not only was it upon him, the disciples began to remember the prophecy that said that the Messiah would come through the Eastern Gate. And their excitement caused them to begin to rejoice. The Bible says that their joy and their excitement and their praise began to spread. It spread so much that the people began to 
to rejoice. And they said, what's going on? We, we feel something. We're experiencing an excitement that we haven't seen before. Verse number 38 says, <clears throat> saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, then the stones would immediately cry out. So in other words, he's saying that they can hold their peace, but holding your peace does not mean that you're not worshiping me. Holding your peace does not mean that you're not praising me. Holding your peace does not mean that I don't reserve the glory. And this is an example of how when Jesus is actively working in your situation and he is entering into a place where he's about to change things and correct things, then we as a church, we as an individual have a responsibility to worship him, to give him glory, because if we don't give him glory, the things that are around us, the rocks and the obstacles that we have been dealing with will begin to praise him. Even the things that we have been dealing with will begin to say he is a deliverer. You're about to be delivered. Your situation is going to change. Why? Because even what we deal with has to acknowledge his authority and his power. The things that we are, that we deal with has to submit to and acknowledge that he is good, even if we won't. And, 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 I'm, and I'm, I'm remembering that. At this time um, of this story, many years later, there was a um, leader, his name was Suleiman. And Suleiman in um, AD 1540 or so, it is said that he sealed the Eastern Gate. <laughs> he sealed the gate, 16 feet of concrete, I think it said. And why did he seal it? He sealed it because he never wanted the Messiah to be able to come through that gate again. He did not want the Messiah to be able to come through that gate again. And that is what Satan tries to do to us today. He wants to seal this gate that is praise. He wants to keep us and prevent us from praising God, from, from rejoicing in, in what God is doing for us. The plan is for us to hold our peace and let the Lord fight our battles. But at the time that God is moving, we are to shout and we are to rejoice. So we cannot be like the gates, the eastern gate that is sealed. We have to know when we have to give God his glory and his praise. Psalms 22 and 3 says, but you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. So what does that tell us? If we don't praise God, he does not have a place to live in our environment because scripture says that that he inhabits the praises of his people. So if you look at your situation, you say, I don't see God anywhere. I'm looking for him to move for me. I'm looking for him to deal with this. And he's not there then it's because we haven't built him a home. We haven't invited him into our environment. The thing that we have to do is we have to praise God. We have to put on our songs of worship. We have to declare what he is going to do for us. We have to set our homes with an atmosphere of praise. I'm an advocate that believes that praise and worship should be played in the home. If you're dealing with situations and problems and issues, Put on some gospel, put on some praise and worship, put on something that says that God is good and his truth endures forever. Put on something that says that I serve a mighty God. Begin to sing songs of praise. Begin not just to read the Bible, but to set an atmosphere of praise. And according to scripture, he says, I will inhabit the praises of my people. When we make it welcome for God to be in our situation, then Satan has to back down and he has to move away. Why? Because the atmosphere gets too hot for him. 
So God deals with us and he and he encourages us to go into a into an offensive uh, stance rather than defensive. Sometimes when we are uh, dealing with something and, and, and it's causing us a problem, we are praising God, but we're not doing it the right way. Oh, God, won't you do something about this? Lord, have mercy. I don't know what's going on. That's not a praise. <laughs> that's not that's frustration. That is human frustration. Now, I'm not God, but if you talk like that, I'm going to let you sit for a bit. You're going to sit in that for a minute. I'm not coming. And I'm a human being and he's wiser than me and his ways are higher than my ways. We know the scripture. So why don't we stick to the plan? Why don't we just rejoice in all things? Why don't we give him thanks? Why don't we just just dare to do what the Bible says? The Bible says that if we praise him, that he will inhabit our situation. I don't know about you, but I need God to come and sit on and sit around some things in my life. I need God to come and sit on and sit around some things in my life. There are family members that are dealing with some stuff and I'm like, Jesus, sit there with them. Hallelujah. Be with them right now. I need you to be in that room. I need you to be in that home. I need you to be on that job. Sit with them, Jesus. Come and sit for a while. And so how can I ask him to sit if the plan is for me to hold my peace, meaning I'm not going to get worried, but for me to shout a shout of victory and praise. Then the first thing I need to do is get back to that plan that says I will praise you in all things, in all things I will give thanks. And as I praise God and as I worship and as I call those things that be not as though they were, meaning I'm not going to be changed by what I see. I'm going to declare what I believe. I'm going to move and migrate from the mindset that says I'm going to talk about what I see and I'm going to go instead in the mindset that says if I believe, then the mountain will move. I'm going to set an atmosphere of praise and I'm going to invite Jesus to sit in that situation. And I believe that when he comes, that he will change, that that things will change. So what does it mean to rejoice and how should we rejoice? What does it mean to praise him? What does that look like? If this is so important, God, how do we do this the right way? When he says something, my question is, Lord, Tell me how to do it because I don't want to mess it up because I know if I do it the way I want to do it, something's going to be off. There's going to be one part of it, one corner that's not going to be covered. I need your help. And so the way that we do it is to acknowledge his power and his authority. Isaiah 45 and 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. So what this scripture in Isaiah says is that I am the only God that can deal with this situation. And I'm going to strengthen you and help you to praise me and to rejoice in me, though you haven't done it in the past, though you have not acknowledged me. Thank God for his mercy where he says, y'all need to understand how to praise me through these things. You need to understand how if you worship me, that I'll come into your situation. The plan is you hold your peace. This ain't your battle. You hold your peace. This is not your fight. You hold your peace. You don't have to have all the answers. You just praise me. Stick to the plan and I will work it out. We understand that God has a purpose for everything. And sometimes we don't even understand it. We don't know why he allows us to go through some stuff. I admit it. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I think I could have come up with a better plan than this. If you just we could have just talked about that, you know, got together. One of those times when I'm praying in my closet, we could have discussed that. You said, come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. He don't want to hear that. <laughs> he says, I have the plan. <clears throat> Stick with the plan that I've given you. I wanted to share with you just um, a scripture that kind of puts it in perspective of not only holding your peace,
but also knowing when to praise. In Acts 16, verse 16 through 28, there is a story of Paul. And Paul is actually walking with some of the other disciples. And there is a, um, a young girl that tells fortunes. And the, and the Bible says that she followed after Paul several days. And she said, behold, these are men who are coming to tell you about the way to eternal life. They're the one they're coming to tell you about the most high God. In verse 18, it says she kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. And when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. And so now Paul has been quiet for several days. He's allowed this young girl to, to walk behind him. She's, she tells fortune, so we know that it is not the power of God. But there comes a certain time when he turns around and he addresses that spirit directly and casts it out. And at that point, he finds himself, both he and Silas, thrown into prison. But what did they do when they were in trouble? What did they do? What did they do after they had been beaten publicly? What did they do? The scripture says in verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other soldiers were listening to them. When suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prisoners doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose and the jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prison prisoners had escaped. And Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Now, if you continue to read that story, you'll see that this same jailer was so impressed with the power of God, with the fact that he that he understood that it was praise that has caused this earthquake, that it caused all of the shackles and all of the doors for all the prisoners to be open. To the extent that he said, what must I do to be saved? In other words, what must I do so that when I start praising God and rejoicing that he will come into my situation the way he came into your situation? Because remember, God inhabits the praises of his people. So what happened was that Paul and Silas prayed and praised God and sang songs and God himself came. And when he came, his, his authority and his glory freed them from what they were in. This is an example of what we have to do as Christians as we praise God, even if we are in a place where we are imprisoned, even if it's imprisoned in our minds or in our emotions or even in our situation, it could be financial. We praise God and we rejoice in him and suddenly things begin to shake loose. And you will know when it's happening because you will have a joy that you cannot explain. You will have a peace about this thing that you just can't understand. And I encourage you at that point, don't stop. Continue to praise God and worship him and see if he won't completely shake this thing off of you. See if he won't completely remove it from your life. See if he won't completely cause you to have a testimony and people will see what you have gone through and they'll see what you have experienced. And they will say, I want to know the God that you serve. I want to know the God that will hear and answer prayer. I want to know the God that will allow you to get into a situation and and then show you the way to get out of it through praise. Hallelujah. Dear Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you, Father God, that you've given us understanding, that you're helping us to know that you have a plan for our lives. That you have a plan so that when we come out of whatever we have gone through and whatever we have been in, that people will know that we have spent time with you. 
So Lord, work this plan in your people. Work this plan in us, Lord. Help us to commit to a lifestyle and a life of worship, prayer, and praise so that we can give a testimony of your goodness. We thank you for this, Lord, in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.